You know, over the years, uh, people, it's not uncommon for people to email me and uh, or, or reach out to me, uh, send me a text or an email or, or a letter even, and suggest things that we ought to preach on, suggest things they'd like me to address in a sermon. And usually it's either a passion area of that individual, something they care deeply about, or it's related to something that's going on in our culture in that moment. It's happened over this COVID season, as you can imagine. But you know, over all the years that I've been preaching and pastoring and leading, it's never once happened where someone has reached out to me or sent me an email and said, you know, Pastor Jeff, I really think you need to preach about money more often. That's never happened. I wonder why that is. Why do you think that is, is that way? And yet, it's something Jesus talked about frequently. It's something that he addressed re- regularly in the New Testament. In fact, in the Gospels, on average, one out of every 10 verses refers to or addresses the subject of money or material possessions. One out of every 10 verses in the Gospels alone. Here's the truth of the matter. You will not be the person God has designed you to be. We will not be the kind of church God wants us to be unless our view of money is shaped by the gospel. Unless we allow Jesus and the authors of, the script, of scripture to speak to us about how we view and think about wealth and possessions. Now, I know many of you are thinking right now, yeah, yeah, I know, Pastor Jeff, I know where this is going. The Bible says money is bad and we should give it all away. Probably you're gonna tell us to give it to the church, right? Well, after all, doesn't the Bible say money is the root of all evil? Well, let's find out. That is one of the phrases we're addressing In this series, Did God Say That? Money is the root of all evil. Perhaps you've said that or heard that said before. I'm going to read from 1 Timothy chapter 6, some selected passages here, and we'll find out what, in fact, the Bible does say. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now skipping to verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Well, you heard it, I hope. It was right there. Did did the Bible say that money is the root of all evil? No, it said something similar. It said the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It sounds very similar, but those couple of words, differences, make a a tremendous difference in the meaning. Now, this is from the letter of 1 Timothy. Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote two letters to Timothy. Timothy's his younger brother, protege in the faith, and he's left Timothy in charge of a church in a city called Ephesus in modern-day Turkey. It's a wealthy city, and there's a young church growing there, people coming to faith in Jesus, figuring out this life of Christ together, meeting and worshiping and learning and being taught. He leaves Timothy to lead them while he's planting other churches. And he writes, two letters to Timothy to instruct and encourage him, basically coach him on how to lead this church. Not surprising then that he addresses the issue of money, how to think about it, how to lead people that have it or that long for it. This passage, I think, is one of the most practical and helpful things we have in the Bible on how we as a church, what our attitude should be regarding money. And what the Bible actually says about money may surprise you a little. It may not be what you think. The Bible does not condemn money or material possessions. It does not condemn it. In fact, the Bible has a lot of very positive things to say about wealth and material possessions. In fact, verse 17, we just read right here in this passage, it says that God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God richly provides things, wealth, material possessions, for our enjoyment. The Bible speaks regularly about working hard, about saving, about investing, about growing your wealth. In fact, you could make the case the Bible argues for a lot of the principles that we like to talk about in capitalism. 
Contrary to the opinions of, of many, the Bible does not promote this view that the material world is, is bad or unspiritual. In fact, the Bible affirms both the possession and the enjoyment of wealth and possessions. But you might say, well, wait, wait, wait a second, Pastor Jeff. What about that story in the New Testament Gospels, you know, where Jesus meets that guy, the rich young ruler, I think he's called, and doesn't he say to him he has to go and sell everything he has and give it all away to the poor? Yes, he does. But in that story, he's addressing something that's in that man's way, his specific spiritual barrier or roadblock to trusting God, which money can be. Notice that in verse 18, the rich are not commanded to stop being rich or to become poor, but they're commanded to be rich in good deeds, and we'll get to that in a minute. They're commanded to be generous. Pastor Brian just talked about that a minute ago. Abraham, Jacob, Job, Solomon, the Bible's full of people that were rich by God's blessing, called to be generous in the world. The point is that there's all kinds of affirmations in the Bible about making money, having possessions. But, on the other hand, The Bible does warn about the deception and the danger of money in our lives. The Bible does regularly and often and strongly warn us about the danger and the deception and what money can do to us if we let it. Many, many warnings about the way money can distort and corrupt and deceive us personally and about how it can be an instrument of oppression in the world. The Bible talks about the giving away of possessions, the sharing with those in need, the distribution of wealth. In fact, you could make the case that there's lots in the Bible that defends the idea of what some people call socialism. Now, I think the Bible neither proposes or opposes capitalism or socialism. The Bible is more nuanced and deeper than that. It defies our human categories of economic systems. And we should be glad that it does, though many have tried to use it to prop up their ideas. The heart of this passage in 1 Timothy tells us that, first, money is a trap. Money is a trap. In verse 9, the Greek word read there, there's a trap set for many. In fact, I'll read it again for you. In verse 9 of 1 Timothy 6, we read that their money is a trap, and the word for, Greek word for trap is the word for snare. He says, People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. The Greek word for trap is the word for snare that you would use to catch small birds or small animals. Now, I I like to watch this show. uh, I'm not sure what channel it's on. I watch it on Netflix called Alone. Perhaps you've seen it. It's it's, they drop off 10 people in remote parts of wherever, like one was in Mongolia or in the in the the Arctic, and they're supposed to survive as long as they can on their own. They get paid if they're the last one left. Now, the truth is they're not that alone. They film themselves. There's crews that check on them regularly, and who knows if they're how alone they actually are. But, you know, I'm fooled because I watch it on TV. And they're alone. And they set traps or snares. And one of my favorite things is watching them go out in the snow or the woods each day to check their snares. Strategically set, right? Hidden in places where they think they're going to catch an animal to catch a bunny, a squirrel, whatever, and then just so they can survive, have something to eat. That's the image that we're given here. A snare, strategically set, invisible, hidden, camouflage. You don't see it. And when you combine that with the Greek word about foolishness in the same passage, what in the Bible's view of foolishness, a fool, is not somebody who's a babbling idiot. It's not, that's not what it means. It means somebody who is so self-deceived, they don't recognize the danger they're in. Somebody who's wise in their own eyes. So you put this idea of a hidden snare and a fool together, and you see what the Apostle Paul is saying. Money has the power to deceive you, and you think you're fine, and you're not. You're about to be caught. You're about to be trapped. Someone who's in denial about their situation, blind to the danger they're in. This is what money can do. It can blind you. Actually, technically, it's the love of money that is the trap, because money has this gravitational pull on our hearts. It pulls us in the wrong directions. It's a danger we just don't see. This is why Jesus warns us so strongly in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. He says to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Did you know there's kinds of greed? Apparently there's all kinds of greed. For life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Jesus says, watch out, be on your guard. Why? Because you don't see what's happening. All kinds of greed, all kinds of 
desire. In fact, the love of money, the word for love there, is, it, it's the same word used for lust or to be in love with, to have a desire out of control. We're blind to this trap, and it's very serious. Jesus uses the word, Paul uses the words, plunge people into ruin and destruction, pierce themselves with many griefs. So let me just tell you a couple of ways that money can blind us. First, it blinds you to who you truly are. Money, if we allow it, can blind us to who we truly are. Notice in verse 17, Paul says, command those who are rich, not suggest to them, not, you know, sometimes rich people get a big head and you might want to just suggest to them. He says, command them. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know a lot of rich people or people at all who like to be commanded. In fact, my experience is very often those who have a lot of money like to do the commanding. Paul says, command them. I remember talking to a friend of mine who's a pastor in a different part of the country, and he said when he first got to his church, there, he was, went to the board meeting. His first board meeting, he realized there was one individual that drove all the decisions. He was the wealthiest guy in the church and the head of the board. And he, my, this pastor friend of mine realized very quickly that there was going to be some sort of power struggle here. And it got to be pretty contentious. They were philosophically in different places. And so my friend waited and, and asked to speak with this individual after a meeting just to kind of clear the air personally. And he said, I was very direct with him. And I called him out on some things, not about his behavior in the meeting, but about his love of money. And the guy was stunned. And he said, no one has ever talked to me that way before. Because I'm the CEO, I'm the boss, I give the orders. No one ever talks to me that way. And he came around to, say, to thank my friend, the pastor, for speaking to him that way because he knew he needed it but no one ever did it. Paul says to Timothy, this young man in this church, this wealthy church, command those who are rich not to be arrogant. It's not an easy thing to do. The word arrogant is the word, it literally means exalted thoughts in Greek. Exalted thoughts about what? About yourself. High-minded thinking about you. Now here's how this works. When you achieve financial success to a certain degree, you, you start to feel good about that success and maybe rightfully so. But you start to project that success into every other area of your life. Well, I've done well in business, therefore I know about marriage, about family, about church, about all other issues. This is what Paul is trying to get at. He's going to get to generosity, but first he's driving at something deeper, at their hearts, at how we view ourselves. Now we talk often around here about the fact that the gospel is the fact that we are saved by grace through faith. It's the free gift of God in Christ. Pastor Brian mentioned the act of generosity, radical generosity by God, giving his son. That's how we're justified. That's how we're made right with God. But the, the natural inclination of the human heart is for self-justification, to justify myself. When you combine the human tendency towards self-justification with financial success, that's a bad recipe, friends. That does toxic things to our souls. We begin to overestimate yourself. In fact, I think money does this. Wealth and financial success causes us to overestimate ourselves. We do this as a culture, as a society as a whole, don't we? We, we defer to those who are wealthy. We figure, well, he or she, they're rich. They must know. He must know. She must know. Why do we do that? Again, there's this gravitational pull or this, things tip in that direction in our hearts and in our society. So Paul says, command them not to think of themselves this way. Now, okay, some of you might be thinking, yes, Paul, that's right. Somebody needs to tell those rich people what's what. Not so fast. If that's what you're thinking right now, you're falling into the trap. Why? Because nobody thinks they're rich. Nobody thinks of themselves as rich. I, I remember playing golf with a friend of mine from church. Uh, he took me golfing. We had a good time together, getting to know each other, talking about our lives, our families, and praying together even a couple times throughout, throughout the round. And at one point, we're talking about, you know, possessions and wealth and money. And he said to me, you know, I make well over a million dollars a year. I almost dropped my putter. <laughs> and he said, but I don't think of myself as very rich. I did drop my putter. <laughs> what? He says, you know, my clients are, they're hundred million dollar people. He said, he, his exact words were, I don't have real money. I don't have crazy money. I thought, he doesn't have real money. What, am I, what do I have, monopoly money? What does that mean? When you begin to do well financially, at whatever level that is for you, when you gain some wealth and some success, you begin to buy and do things you weren't able to buy and do before. 
And those things that were once luxuries to you now become commonplace in your life and they become necessities. You feel like you need them. Where you lived fine without them for a long period of time, they were not necessities, they were luxuries. Now because they're regular and you can afford them, you see them as necessities. You're being blinded to what you truly have or don't think you don't have. Additionally, as you gain wealth, you're able to live places and go places you couldn't live and go before, and therefore you associate with people at a higher socioeconomic category. And when you get into the next category socioeconomically, you're around people who there's always someone who has more than you. Isn't it funny that we never compare ourselves down in terms of what we have? We always compare ourselves up. I'm doing well, but not like that person. I mean, I'm okay, but not... That's exactly what's happening to my friend. Now, in fairness to my friend, he's very generous. He loves the Lord. I love his family. But he was just expressing the truth of what money does to our hearts. Bernard of Clairvaux, one of the medieval Christian fathers, wrote, To see a man truly humble under prosperity is the greatest rarity in all the world. To see someone truly humble under great prosperity is rare indeed. But it shouldn't be for those of us who follow Jesus. Do you see the trap? So many of us fall into it. And it's not just those of us who have money. It's those of us who don't and desire it. Because envy, jealousy, resentment, insecurity for those that don't have it and desire it. And then pride, self-reliance, arrogance, self-righteousness for those who do have it. No one's immune to this trap, friends, is Paul's point. Second, it blinds you to your true hope. Your true hope. Paul says this very thing here in this passage. Later on, uh, he says in verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world to be not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. The word for hope is the Greek word elipizo, and it means waiting or expectancy. Think about that. To hope is to wait expectantly. Don't put your expectant waiting in wealth, which is uncertain. Boy, how relevant is that? Don't put your expectant waiting for your life, what you expect from life in the Dow Jones or the NASDAQ or your 401k or your career. It's uncertain. It's really uncertain. But place it in God, who is a 100% guarantee. Now, most of us would not ever say, my hope is in my money. I wouldn't say that. You probably wouldn't say that. My hope, my security, what I expect out of life, well, that's in my bank account. That's in my investment portfolio. But a closer examination of of our hearts and our lives reveals that we actually expect, we hope, our money will provide us with greater happiness and security. We live as if it will, even if we don't say that. And this brings us to the key to avoiding the trap of money. The key to avoiding the trap of money is, Paul says, this phrase, godliness with contentment. Verse 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. Now the word gain there in Greek literally means wealth. Godliness with contentment, whatever that is, means great wealth. Whoa, really? Godliness with contentment is great gain, great wealth. It's true riches. Remember my friend said, I don't have real money. Paul's saying, this is real money. This is real wealth. Godliness with contentment. Contentment means your hope and your sense of inner joy, peace, and security are not conditional. It does not fluctuate up and down with the stock market. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, keep our lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Paul, in Philippians chapter 4, calls this the secret of contentment. Let me read this, this remarkable passage for you. You'll recognize the last half of the last verse, but let me give you the context. Paul, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. 
Have you heard that last phrase before? I can do all things for, through Christ who strengthens me or through him who gives me strength. We see it on athlete shoes or Instagram posts or it's tweeted out all over the place. We, we write it on postcards or coffee mugs or little frames in our homes. But what is Paul really saying here? We typically hear that phrase, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, through Christ who strengthens me, meaning Jesus gives me strength so that I can achieve my life goals, so I can live my best life now, so I can do what I want because he's going to strengthen me. That's not at all what Paul is saying. He's saying, I've learned the secret of contentment. What does he mean? I've been in plenty and I've been in want. And in all situations, I'm content, meaning my sense of inner joy and happiness is not conditional based on what I have or how it's going. Wouldn't you like to live that way? I want to. I don't always. I want to live that way. True freedom. Paul says great gain. True wealth. In fact, the, the Greek philosophers of, of, of the ancient world and of Paul's day saw this as the highest virtue, that your inner peace would not be dictated by your circumstances. You're kind of above that. Paul says there's one way, to have contentment, godliness, with contentment. Paul says something else here. He says, we must learn this. I have learned the secret. It's not, it's hard work. We have to unlearn some things in order to learn this. We think if I just had a little bit more money, I'd feel better about myself. But actually, I can tell you, I talk to people who have a lot as a pastor, self-doubt only increases. Insecurity grows. We think if I just had a little more money, others would like me more. Actually, it complicates your relationships. Anybody who has a lot will tell you that. We think if I just had a little more money, I would feel safer and more secure. But actually, you worry more than ever because you have so much more to lose. So what is, what's the secret of contentment that Paul says he's learned? Well, Jonathan Edwards wrote a sermon when he was 18 years old called On Christian Contentment. And he basically boils it down to three things. That we can live with this inner joy that's untouchable by the conditions around us because three things are true. I'll list them for you. First, your bad things will turn out for good. Second, your good things cannot be taken away. And third, the best things are yet to come. I love that. Your bad things will turn out to good. Even the, the worst things in your life, the most painful, difficult circumstances, while God didn't cause them and doesn't rejoice in them, he can, because he's that kind of God, he's that big, redeem them and use them to bring about his good purposes ultimately. Our bad things will turn out for good. Second, the good things in my life can't be taken away. What are those good things? Adoption into his family. You know, but Allie was just singing, uh, leading us in some songs. And when I see her, I was thinking about the story, if you watched on Wednesday Night Live a couple of weeks ago, where she and Jonathan talked about their story of adoption, their little boy, Jaden, and how that story and that beautiful family is really a picture to us of what God does for all of us, adopts us into his family, calls us his sons and daughters because of his grace. In a couple of weeks, Pastor Sterling is going to address the topic, are we all God's children? And what that really means, what the Bible really says about that. We know in Christ, we are his sons and daughters. That's the good thing, and it can never be taken away. You can lose your 401k. You can never lose that. The security you have in him. And third, the best things are yet to come. Meaning, this life is not all there is. If you see this life as all there is, if this is just it, and, you, and you, you go around once and that's it, so grab all you can, do the most good you can, have as much fun as you can, whatever your philosophy is, because when you die, you're worm food, or it, you float off and it's kind of vague and I don't know, but this is it. This is what matters most. If that's how you live, then money becomes really important, of ultimate importance. But if you recognize this life matters, but it's a, it's a pathway to God's eternal kingdom. The best things that I'm promised in Christ are not here and now. They're coming someday. Peter calls them an inheritance kept for us, unfading, imperishable, untouchable. So in Christ, my bad things turn out for good. My good things can't be taken away, and the best things are yet to come. When, you, when that gets into your, not just your head, but your heart, there's a contentment that comes over you. And I'll be honest, I, I want to live consistently in that place of contentment, but I fluctuate. Maybe you do as well. But in those moments when I recognize the truth of that in my soul, 
It's freeing. It's totally freeing. And when you're that free, then you're ready to hear what Paul says next, that money is a tool. Money's a tool. It's a trap. It can also be a tool. He doesn't start with be generous, give lots away. Because here's the thing. If he did that, if he just said the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, therefore give it all away, there's a problem. If you find your security in money, then if I tell you to give it away, I'm asking you to give away your security. That's terrifying. If you find your significance in money and I tell you to give it away, you're giving away your significance. That's scary. It's hard to do. But, but, if your security and your significance are in Christ and him alone, then you're free to give. Because you're not giving away your significance and your security. Those can't be taken away from you because they're in Christ. That's what Paul is talking about when he says the secret. And in verse 7, something very interesting. Paul says in verse 7 of 1 Timothy 6, he says, that I took, brought nothing into this world and I'll take nothing out of this world. Most scholars think Paul here is paraphrasing an Old Testament ancient story in Job, where Job says, naked I came into the world and naked I will go out of the world. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What is this about nakedness and having nothing? You come into the world naked. And, it doesn't, and when the Bible talks about nakedness, it doesn't just mean nudity. It means vulnerable, having nothing. It means weak. That's how we are born and that's how we die. I, and, and our whole life is trying to cover up this nakedness, this sense of vulnerability, this sense of, of being out of control. And here, it really comes down to this, friends. Either you're going to let Christ cover you your nakedness, your vulnerability, your weakness. Or you're going to try to do it yourself through wealth, through possessions, through status. And those are, to use the words of Genesis chapter 3, just fig leaves. They won't cover. They won't suffice. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 says, You say I am rich and I've acquired wealth, but do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. But, the verse goes on. You can come and buy true, true, true clothing. Receive it, what's given to you in Christ. So money is a tool for two reasons, and then we'll close. To bless others and to build God's kingdom. To bless other people and to build God's kingdom. To take part in what God is doing. It's hard to be generous if money is your identity and your significance and your security, because that's the trap. But when you're free from that, you get to see your wealth and material possessions that God has given you it's to be rich in good deeds, to make a difference in the world. I don't think most people that I interact with fail in generosity. And I fail in generosity. I'm not as generous as I want to be. Purely because they're selfish. I mean, we all are selfish, but I don't think that's the primary reason. I think the primary reason is fear. We're afraid. We're afraid because we've attached our security and significance to it, and we're afraid of losing that. When your security and your significance, friends, are in Christ, you can never lose that. This is the secret of contentment. And oh, what a secret weapon we would be in this neighborhood, in this community, in this world, and for the kingdom if we could learn this. If Chapel Street Church could learn this truth, not in our heads, but in our hearts, and get free from that, what a powerful tool we would be in the hands of the one who's given us everything. Let's pray. Father, we recognize that the love of money is at the, is at the root of all evil. Money itself is not evil. You, you, you bless us with possessions and wealth and resources. You're a generous God, but you do it so that we would be free to invest in your kingdom and your righteousness. Father, we pray by your grace that you would indeed free us from finding our significance and our security in what we have. And that you would help us learn the secret of contentment to find our security and our significance only in you, Lord Jesus. That the best things are yet to come. What we have in you can never be taken away. We thank you, we praise you for this truth. In your name, amen.